Uh, hello, my name is Adrian Love and I am going to be talking you through the water quality, the first of two water quality lectures. This one is about water chemistry. Uh, we're going to be looking at the basics of what water is and also what it has got in it and what fish need. So feel free to stop the presentation at any time and make your own notes. Some of the information will be new to you and some of it will be just a recap of what you already know. Let's begin. So first we'll start with the basics. What is water? I'm sure you already know. Water is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom in the familiar H2O uh, molecule. It looks like this. The oxygen is a, at a slight angle to the two hydrogen atoms. Uh, but this gives the water molecule some really unique properties that help it to do things that no other molecules can. First of all, uh, this oxygen has a negative charge and these hydrogen, let me just get a pointer here. This oxygen has a negative charge and these hydrogen have a slightly positive charge. So this end of the molecule will be slightly negative. Go, let's try this. This will be slightly negative and this end of the molecule will be slightly positive. So if the water molecule comes across a, another positive element like calcium, for instance, then calcium will be attracted to this end of the molecule. If the water comes in contact with a negative uh, element, such as uh, chlorine, chloride, then chloride is negative and it will be attracted to the positive end. So it doesn't matter what the water molecule comes into contact with, it will be able to interact with that and um, sometimes we call that dissolving. Uh, so it will be able to take the element into solution and um, dissolve it. So that means that you get lots and lots of things that are dissolved in water. Anything that has a charge, anything that has a charge can be dissolved by water. The only things that can't be dissolved by water are things without a charge, like fats, for instance. They, don't, they are neutral, they don't have a charge. So the water molecule can dissolve uh, almost all things, and what we're particularly interested in in the natural habitat is minerals that it comes into contact with as it flows through them. Water lands on the rock and often passes through the rock, and as it passes through the rock, it will dissolve the rock and pick up minerals. So you'll get a, a bunch of mi minerals or a bunch of elements in water like this. These are three different types of water. They are generalizations. So um, it doesn't always look like this. And in fact, it never looks exactly like this, but it's useful for us to just have a comparison. So let's start with seawater, first of all. Um, hopefully you are aware that salt water has got a lot of salt in it. And the salt is sodium chloride. So here's sodium and here's chloride. Sodium chloride makes up a big chunk of all of the minerals that are in water. Uh, but there are others there as well. Let's go on to fresh water. Really important ions in fresh water are calcium and magnesium. Um, they are by far the two most important um, minerals in fresh water. You can see some of you, while they're spotted, well, sodium is more abundant often than magnesium. That's true, but sodium doesn't have such an important role as calcium and magnesium do, does. So these are really, really important. If you remember one thing is that the minerals in fresh water are calcium and magnesium, and they are almost always associated with bicarbonate. Calcium and magnesium have a positive charge and bicarbonate has a negative charge. So it's calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate. Really, really important. Uh, rainwater, rainwater uh, 
passes through the atmosphere and as the rain passes through the atmosphere it picks up washes out any minerals that are in the atmosphere um, and so you will get quite a lot of sodium and chloride in rainwater uh, and that's because of salt spray the water the sea the the planet is 70 odd percent sea and so it contains a lot of uh, sodium chloride in the atmosphere uh, that the rain will wash out but it's got some other bits and pieces in there as well uh, let's look at that in terms of percentage so these are absolute amounts uh, in terms of parts per million or milligrams per liter it's the same thing but let's look at it in terms of percentages and you can see that if you look at salt at salt water uh, then let's see 92 percent over 92 percent of all of the minerals in salt water are sodium chloride so it's really dominated by just two minerals there are lots of others and in fact all of the minerals uh, sorry all of the elements in the periodic table are found in salt water even gold is in salt water in tiny tiny trace quantities but the sodium chloride is by far the most dominant of the minerals. Freshwater, in terms of percentages, calcium is uh, almost always the most dominant mineral. Um, magnesium is usually about three or four times less than calcium. Um, and you can see that bicarbonate makes up half of the minerals in freshwater often. Not always. As I said, these are just generalizations. Uh, and then rainwater, again, uh, sodium and chloride make up the biggest ones because of the salt spray like I've explained. So these are just indications of all the things that are dissolved in water. Water is never on planet Earth just H2O. Fish can't even survive in just H2O. Um, they have to have minerals in them and all natural water on earth has some minerals in it more or less but it does vary a lot so in the next slide we'll be looking at how it varies okay let's look at how water varies uh, according to uh, different rivers and different sources as i explained water will dissolve any rock that it travels through so for all of the different rocks in the world there will be different waters in the world. And if the water hasn't passed through the rock, it will be a different again. This is a really good explanation of what I mean in the Amazon jungle. These are two tributaries of the Amazon. Um, so they're geographically in very similar places, but they have traveled on their journey through very different rocks. And you can see visually how different they are. This type of water is called black water in fact the river is called rio negro it's uh, black water and it has very different chemicals in it compared to this river here uh, and these two rivers will have completely different fish in them for many miles downstream they don't mix and the fish in this side will be completely different to the fish in this side and it's all because of what the rivers of uh, what the water has passed through on the way to the river. This one, the water has passed through rock and dissolved the rock and it has very high levels of minerals in it. This one, the water has uh, not been able to pass through the rock um, because the rock was uh, wouldn't let water through and so the it has very few minerals dissolved in it. As a, another generalization, this table shows different waters in different continents. Remember, it changes for every different type of rock. Uh, and you have just seen that even two rivers more or less side by side each other can be completely different. But as a general rule, it just helps us to know how much it varies depending on the river. So let's get to examples. Let's have a look at calcium, for instance. So calcium in Europe is a general amount is 31 milligrams per litre or parts per million. 
uh, compare that to the Amazon that we just looked at, one of the rivers in South America, and that's 7.2. So just for one element, there is over a four-fold difference between uh, some of the rivers in South America and some of the rivers in Europe. That's just one uh, element, calcium. It varies uh, a lot. So what I want you to take from this table is not the numbers or try and remember how much the levels are or anything because it varies for every stream, every river, every tributary, it completely varies. What I do want you to bear in mind is that it, how much it varies. That's the important thing. Okay, let's look a little bit more detail about the how those variations uh, affect other things. Because it varies so much and because you've got so many different minerals, uh, all at different levels, it's very difficult to give one value to the dissolved minerals in water. Uh, instead, unfortunately for us, there are many ways of describing the different minerals in water. One way of describing it is by measuring something called the alkalinity. Uh, alkalinity measures uh, the number of chemicals that are interacting with uh, an acid. Don't worry about the, the chemistry of it, but that's in fact what alkalinity measures. Don't get confused between alkalinity and alkaline. Alkaline is often used to describe how uh, basic something is, where it is on the pH scale. Alkalinity describes how many minerals are interacting with acid. It's about a mineral. Alkalinity is about a mineral level. Another way of describing the minerals in water is hardness. Even with hardness, there are different types of hardness. There's general hardness uh, and carbonate hardness. And even within that, there are subsections. So it's hardness is a different, difficult thing to, to measure, um, but it's another way of describing minerals in water. Another way of describing minerals in water is uh, TDS, which stands for total dissolved solids. Don't worry about the different ways of describing it. I'm just saying that there are many ways to describe minerals in water because there are so many minerals and so many different things that can change them. Just remember that it's a, there are a lot, lots of ways to remember minerals. So if you are looking at a paper and they say, we measured minerals like this, then go with it. That's just what they chose to do. There's not one right or wrong way. It's just a way of measuring it. Let's go back to our Amazon example. Um, this river here uh, has lots and lots of minerals because it's passed through rocks and dissolved them and it will usually have a high alkalinity. Associated with a high alkalinity is a high pH. So the pH will generally be above seven. Seven is neutral, I'm sure you know. So this will have a pH of 7.5 or even eight, something like that. This river on this side, will the black water, will have very few minerals because it hasn't passed through rocks, it's passed over rocks. And because it has very few minerals, it will have a low alkalinity. And usually that's associated with a low pH. So certainly lower than seven, perhaps even lower than six. The pH of water varies just as much as the minerals do. Uh, and they are both working with each other. Uh, pH and, and the minerals are interacting all the time. So it varies a lot. However, we can say that fresh water has a pH generally between six and eight. It can be lower than six and it can be higher than eight, but generally 90% of fresh water is between six and eight. Salt water has a much narrower band uh, salt water usually has a pH between 8 and 8.5. It's more consistent. Let's have a look at salt water in the next slide. 
OK, let's take a look at how salinity varies. Salinity is uh, a way that we describe how much salt is in water, all of the salts that are in water. But you know now the two main salts in salt water are sodium and chloride together, sodium chloride. Salinity varies a lot depending on evaporation and the rainfall. It's a combination of two. If you have a lot of rainfall, a lot of fresh water going in to the sea, it will lower the salinity. If you have a lot of evaporation, then it will increase the salinity. The balance between fresh water going in and evaporation going out is what controls the salinity. But if we look at it in a global scale, this is a, a map of how salinity varies across the world's oceans. Uh, and you can see that very broadly, if you take a line going across here, generally it has slightly lower salinity. And that's because this is the equator, which has a lot of rain. Uh, this is why the rainforests are just here and just here. And so usually you'll get slightly lower salinity because of all the rain falling on the sea and the rivers like you know, the Congo just here emptying out into the sea. Um, where there's a lot of evaporation, like where I'm speaking from just now, is in Malta, which is just in the middle of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is uh, salty because it has a lot of evaporation and not many fresh water flowing uh, into it. So it's getting saltier and saltier as the years go on. And in a few hundred million years time, the Mediterranean won't exist at all. It will just be a salt pan. Um, uh, but for now, it's the, in, the salinity is quite high, about 37 parts per thousand. Um, generally, the world's Oceans will vary between 37 and 34, but if you took a very broad number, something that you can take home and remember is it's 35. Generally, if you measure salt water, it has a salinity of 35 parts per thousand, um, plus or minus one part per thousand, most of it. You can see on this map here, most of it is blue, right? And so most of it is down here, 35 or 34 parts per thousand. OK, let's look at the temperature of water. First of all, water is extremely resistant to changes in temperature. There is nothing on planet Earth that is more resistant to changing temperatures than water. In fact, in the known universe, as far as we know, there is only one substance that is more resistant to changing temperatures, and that's liquid ammonia, which doesn't occur on planet Earth. So it is extremely res resistant to change temperature. You, what I mean by that is you need a huge amount of energy to increase the temperature of water, but also if water cools, it releases a huge amount of energy. And that's really useful because that means that our planet is quite thermally stable because so much of it is water, which is good for us because we don't deal with massive temperature, temperature fluctuations very well. Uh, temperature has a huge effect on all aquatic life uh, because it will affect the, the metabolism of all life within the water. But not only does it affect life directly, it affects life indirectly because water affects the physical properties of water, what water can do, how it reacts. So temperature has huge effects and it's something that we really ought to look at in more detail, which we'll be looking at in the next slide. Okay, let's look at how uh, temperature affects other things in water. First of all, we'll look at the effects on fish and other organisms. Fish 
can't control their body temperature, unlike you and I. So whatever the temperature outside is, is going to affect them inside as well, has a huge impact on them. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is a New Zealand uh, species of fish. Um, and these scientists were measuring the growth of fish at different temperatures. And what they found was temperature is along this axis here, that's called the x-axis, and this is the growth, how much the fish grew on this axis here called the y-axis. As the temperature went up, the growth of fish went up. All these dots here are different measurements that they took. Temperature was going up and up as the um, so the growth was going up as the temperature increased. And that's because a lot of uh, reactions in our body and in the fish's body depends on temperatures. They're just chemical reactions. And if you heat the thing, then chemical reactions speed up very often. The interaction of the, of the atoms speeds up because of thermodynamics. And so you will get an increase in the, the rate so all of the rates of, of uh, growth and the enzymes and everything else is increasing all the time. So up to a point, the more you increase the temperature, the more you increase the growth. And that happens up to a perfect temperature here, where all of the enzymes and all of the different reactions are happening at their perfect temperature. If you exceed that temperature, then the enzymes are, are not designed to work at higher temperatures and very quickly growth will uh, decline because it's just too hot for the fish to function properly. This is the observations from the measurements, measurements they took and this is the model that they got from it. As you increase the temperature growth increases up to a perfect temperature and then it drops off. If we were to keep this species of fish or wanted to grow it in a fish farm, this is the temperature that we should look at keeping that fish at. Uh, let's see, what's that? That is about just less, about 17.5 degrees centigrade, something like that. That's the temperature that we should look at keeping that fish in. If we grew the fish at 18, we could, you'd see that the growth would be um, damaged. And if we grew them at 14, the growth would be damaged. So we want to keep them about 17 degrees, something like that. OK. Let's have a look at a different um, property. This is on how well the fish convert the food that they eat into their own body. It's called food conversion. So this is in salmon and two different types of salmon. Uh, this is smaller salmon, and you can see that as you increase the temperature, again, looking along the x-axis here, as you increase the temperature, the ability of fish to convert food into their own body goes up, up to the perfect temperature of 13.4, and then the enzymes stop working so well and the conversion decreases. Uh, in bigger fish, the, the same thing happens, you get the same shape, but the perfect temperature for those enzymes is about 11, and that's to do with their, their uh, life history, uh, where they naturally grow up, whether it's streams, <clears throat> which um, tend to be slightly warmer, or deeper water, which tend to be slightly uh, colder. So if we were to keep salmon and we wanted to farm them, if we had fish between uh, around 70 or 100 grams, we would want to keep the temperature as near to 13.4 as we could. If we are keeping larger fish, we would keep it at 11 degrees. The take home message is make sure that the temperature is optimal for the fish because it varies everything about them, how much they grow, how well they convert food, how well they reproduce, how much they reproduce, their behavior, Everything is uh, determined by the temperature. Let's have a look at another uh, property of temperature. OK, let's look at uh, how temperature affects water in a physical way. We've looked at how it affects uh, fish uh, biologically and how does it affect fish in their environment in terms of what it does to the water. 
Uh, first thing, probably one of the most important ways that temperature affects water is temperature affects the ability of water to hold oxygen. Just here we've got a graph. This is temperature again on the x-axis and this is how much oxygen that water can keep, how much it can physically keep in it. Doesn't matter about how much you oxygenate it or how much you aerate it or how many bubbles are going through or anything. It's physically how much that water can keep inside it. And as you can see, as the temperature goes up, the ability of water to hold oxygen goes down always. There's two different lines here. The dark blue line is fresh water and the line underneath is seawater. Salt water naturally holds less oxygen than fresh water. But doesn't matter what the water is, if you increase the temperature, water can't hold as much oxygen. That is always the case and that's what you should learn from that graph. The higher the temperature, the lower the oxygen. Always. Doesn't matter how much you aerate it or how much oxygen you put in, if the water is warm, it can't hold the oxygen. The oxygen will just go straight back into the atmosphere. It just, water won't hold it. Uh, let's look at the effect of water, of temperature on the density of water. This is temperature again on our X axis, and this is the density of water on our Y axis. And the pattern is that as you uh, decrease the temperature, the density gets more and more and more. Or as you increase the temperature, the density gets less and less. So you've got this pattern just here going down as you increase the temperature. But what's really curious about water is that there's a magical, <laughs> magical, there's a number just here, four degrees, and that is the special temperature. Anything higher than four degrees, the density gets less which is the same for everything. But anything less than four degrees, the density also gets less. And water is unique in that. Nothing else will have a graph like that. And that's because of the structure that water forms when it forms ice. The molecules get further apart from each other because of that charge I was talking about before. So four degrees, remember that plus four degrees, anything higher than that, the temperature, the water gets less dense, anything less than that, the water gets less dense. Why is that important? Who cares? Well, ice floats, right? You know that. Ice floats, icebergs float. <clears throat> and the reason the iceberg floats is that the ice, which is at less than four degrees, is less dense than the water that it is uh, floating on top of. If this weren't the case, then water would freeze from the bottom up. So all of the creatures that are living on the bottom, as soon as it got cold, they get frozen solid. Instead, the ice freezes from the top because it's float. It's less dense. And so creatures can live down in the lower depths because they don't get frozen. If you go uh, deep, in any river or any stream or in the ocean or, or a lake, the bottom of the lake always, if it's deep enough, will always be four degrees because that's the densest water that there is. Even in the middle of Africa, the water down the bottom of the lake, if it's very deep, will be four degrees because it's always the most dense, the heaviest water, if you like. Okay, <clears throat> let's take us a, a uh, uh, take home message, the higher the temperature, the lower the density. The higher the temperature, the lower the density. And also the lower the temperature, the lower the density past this magical four degrees just here. One more thing there. This is the effect of temperature on a chemical. This is a really important chemical to fish because it is very toxic to them. It kills them at very, very low levels. The, chem the chemical is called ammonia and we will talk about it in the next series of lectures. But this is what's important. The warmer the water, the more toxic ammonia is. The toxic bit of ammonia is called unionized. And as you increase the temperature, the amount of unionized ammonia, of the toxic ammonia, increases more and more. So. The higher the temperature, the more toxic ammonia is. 
so you can have two water containers. You can have this one where the temperature is at 10 degrees and this one where the temperature is at 20 degrees. And you can have exactly the same amount of ammonia in both, but the temperature at 20, at 20 degrees just here, sorry, 20 degrees just here would be toxic to fish and the water at 10 degrees just here would not be toxic. The higher the temperature, the more toxic ammonia is. So we can see that temperature has big impact, impacts, not only on the way that fish perform themselves biologically in terms of their growth, their feeding, their uh, how well they reproduce and so on, but also on their environment. It affects the oxygen in water, it affects the toxins in water, and it affects the actual density of the water itself. Let's go on to the microbial water quality. Well, uh, some bacteria that is found in water samples can cause diseases in fish, not usually in a healthy fish, but if the fish is stressed or is overcrowded, then the bacteria will take opportunity to cause a disease in fish. Uh, this is a, a typical bacteria um, that causes disease. It's uh, the bacteria is called uh, Flexibacter, and the disease is called fin rot because of the symptoms. It rots away at the edges of the fins. Uh, Flexibacter is very often found in lots of water samples, um, usually just doing nothing at all. But in some cases, if the fish is damaged or if the immune system is reduced, then the bacteria will cause a disease. So generally, you ought to try and keep bacterial levels low just to avoid the possibility of this happening. However, the main issue with bacteria in water is the effect of bacteria on oxygen. And to show what I mean, there's this diagram just here. Hopefully you can see here the microorganisms, bacteria and fungi, uh, they are these green circles. The oxygen are the blue circles and organic compounds, things that rot in the water like proteins, they are the brown circles. If we have a lot of microorganisms, they all consume oxygen and they will, there will be so many of them that they will suck all of the oxygen out of the water before our fish can get it. So they will decrease the amount of oxygen that's available in the water because of them breathing it all. If you increase the amount of organic compounds in the water, that's the food for the microorganisms. So if you increase things like proteins and organic food, then you'll increase the microorganisms. And if you increase the microorganisms, they will all breathe the oxygen. And so you won't have enough oxygen for your fish. So the amount of bacteria or the amount of food that increases the bacteria in water is very good at indicating how, how good that water quality is. If there are few bacteria and very little organic pollution, let's say, then there will be lots of oxygen available for our fish. It's such a good indicator of the quality of water, it's got its own term. It's called the biological oxygen demand. The demand for oxygen from all of these microorganisms. The higher the biological oxygen demand, the lower the oxygen. So if you had really dirty water with lots of bacteria, they would suck up all of the oxygen and means our fish would uh, suffer or even die. It doesn't have to be a bad pollution, anything organic. A really uh, serious uh, pollutant in water is milk, because milk is fantastic for growing bacteria. If there is a milk spill in a river, it's an ecological disaster, because the milk will grow lots of bacteria, they will suck up all of the oxygen, and there will be no oxygen for the fish and the invertebrates and the, all of the other uh, life in the water, and the river will die because all the bacteria have used up all of the oxygen. Well, 
OK, we have looked at the different minerals in water, how it might affect the pH of water. We've looked at the temperature of water, the salinity of water. If we get a different water source, how do we make sure that all of these things are suitable for the fish? First of all, you have to bear in mind that depending on where your water is from dictates how you treat it. Because it will have different properties of it. Water that's from a tap will have different stuff that you need to do compared to water that's from uh, the ground or the sea. So first of all, it depends where your water is from. One thing that is always the case <clears throat> is temperature must be OK. So it doesn't matter if it's from the tap or from the sea. The very always with any water sample, doesn't matter where it's from, is that temperature has got to be OK for fish. Remember that temperature has a huge impact on the fish and on the water itself. So make sure the temperature is right, first of all. That's always the case. But how about other things that you might need to adjust? If the water comes from a tap, then you will probably need to reduce or remove chlorines and chemicals called chloramines. Chlorines are put into water uh, in order to sterilize it, in order to take away the bacteria. And the uh, chlorine is very good at killing things and in high enough concentrations, it will kill fish too. So you have to remove chlorines before you expose the fish to tap water. Chlorine is a gas and it leaves the water very quickly. So quite often water, uh, chemical, uh, water companies will uh, put chloramines into the water. Chloramines are not a gas, they are a solid dissolved in water and they are much more stable. So you have to know which of these you have got in the water and remove them uh, before you put fish in that water. Um, if you're getting water from a natural source, such as the sea, like here, or uh, a lake or a river, consider whether you need to remove bacteria. Remember the problems with bacteria. Number one, it can affect the fish itself by causing disease. Number two, it has bacteria. Bacteria consume oxygen. Lots of bacteria consume lots of oxygen, means that there's none for our fish. So consider removing bacteria from the water before you use it. Also, if the water has got lots of solids in it, like the sea, or remember the water that was from the Amazon, not the black water, the, the white water, lots of solids, you might want to consider removing that uh, before you put the fish in it. If the water is from the ground, then it might have dissolved gases in it that could be a problem. Water from the ground <clears throat> has, is under pressure, right? Because it's got thousands, millions of, of tons of rock on top of it. And so gases can be squeezed into the water uh, because of the high pressure. And if you bring the water to the top, to the surface very quickly, then the pressure is released and those gases, rather than being in the water, will come out of the water. And that's a problem if the fish can't metabolize, can't do anything with that gas. The gas that is a problem is nitrogen. We and fish don't metabolize nitrogen. We can't do anything with it. So let's say that that nitrogen <clears throat> is dissolved and then suddenly it comes out and it's in the, the gill or the blood system of the fish when it comes out. It will stay as a bubble and that will uh, either block an, a blood vessel or cause some sort of physical damage. Uh, that's what we call the bends in diving, where you have come up from the bottom to the top of the sea very quickly and the nitrogen uh, comes out of solution and causes all sorts of problems. So gases that have come from under the ground will need the, uh, sorry, the water that's come from under the ground will need the gases um, made safe. And it's very easy to do that. You just need to bring the water up to the surface and let it um, stand. Uh, and all of the gases, the nitrogen, will just get to, um, to whatever the environmental levels are, and that's fine for the fish. Okay, 
let's summarize what we have learned then. Let's bring on a fish. This is a type of fish called a tilapia. Uh, the species is Oreochromis niloticus. It's a very common, uh, commonly farmed fish. And let's put all that we have learned about the water requirements and the water quality and apply it to this fish. Let's say we were going to farm Oreochromis niloticus. What would we need to consider? Well, first of all, temperature. Remember the two ways the temperature will affect fish. Number one affects them directly. Things like growth, things like how well they process food, things like their reproduction, remember? The other way that water affects, uh, the temperature affects the water is, can you remember? How much oxygen it can hold, the toxicity of chemicals, the density of the water itself. So tilapia are a warm water species. They require water temperature between 27 and 30. Oxygen. <clears throat> oxygen is very important, of course, for all living things. And so the oxygen of tilapia has to be above 6.5 milligrams per litre. And in the next series of lectures, we'll look at how you would maintain the oxygen at that sort of level. Remember, the warmer the temperature, the less oxygen the water can hold. So do consider that. Uh, salinity. <clears throat> salinity, actually, these fish are quite tolerant of a wide range of salinity. Can you remember what uh, a, a standard concentration of salinity was in the sea? 35. So these fish can't stand full seawater, but they can stand quite high levels of salinity, maybe uh, three quarters of the strength of seawater, 25 parts per thousand is their tolerance limit. Most fish are not as tolerant as this. Most fish would either be uh, freshwater zero or they'd be saltwater 35, and very few can stand something in the middle. Alkalinity. Can you remember what alkalinity measured? It was the amount of minerals in the water and how it interacts with acids. Alkalinity for these fish should be around 0.6 MEQs, that's something called milliequivalents per litre. Don't worry about the figure, just know that there is a, uh, a level that is optimum for the fish and that's what you should recreate if you want to grow them. pH. Remember that pH and alkalinity are interact with each other. But the pH of these fish is somewhere ideally between 7 and 8. They will tolerate less than 7, they will tolerate more than 8, but they won't be perfect. You might get more disease, you might get more stress, they won't grow as well. So if we want to keep these fish in an optimum condition, these are the sort of parameters that we should be considering. And you know a little bit more now about how they vary in all the different water samples and how you uh, change them to make them perfect for the fish that you are keeping. These are my contact details. Uh, please feel free to drop me a line if you have any further questions uh, or anything that you would like explaining more. Thank you.